the latest tech. I'm Alexa. I can answer your questions. Interviews. And we are evolving and we are seeing an amazing opportunity that is happening. Accessibility. Accessibility is, is, is one of our core values. It's even a part of our mission statement. This is Double Tap TV. Welcome to another edition of Double Tap TV. Thank you guys so much for being here each and every single week. We invite you to join us and take part in the show. So many different ways to get in touch with us. The email address is feedback at ami.ca. Of course, you can send us anything there. On Twitter, we're at Double Tap Canada. And if you use that hashtag, which is Ask Double Tap, we'll get to your questions. We're actually planning a show all about your questions. So get your feedback in. It is Ask Double Tap, that hashtag. And of course, on Twitter, at Double Tap Canada. And now on Instagram, we are at Double Tap dot online. I am Marco Flalo. Alongside me each and every single week is Stephen Scott. He in Glasgow, I in Montreal. Thank you guys for being here. Stephen, thank you for being here each and every single week. It's so nice to have a partner that I can rely on. Well, you know, that's what I'm here for. I am reliable to a fault. Stephen, what is the first time that you heard any inkling about the possibility of cars driving autonomously? I was thinking about this the other day. It feels like it's been forever we've been hearing about the idea of autonomous cars or driverless cars, as I prefer to call them, because and I'm, I, I'm quite specific about that, because I think it's it's the key here is the cars driving entirely by themselves. I mean, I think about how long it's been. It's probably been 10 years. I mean, of course, growing up with the, you know, programs on TV like the Jetsons or Back to the Future movies. You know, you kind of dreamed about them uh, long before that, but it was all sci-fi at that point. And then, you know, in the last 10 years, we've been talking about them as reality in the last five years, even more so. And we're seeing examples now, real world examples of what this could and will, I guess, be. I think on my end, you know, Tesla probably is one of the obviously more recent iterations of autonomous driving vehicles that I can think of, where we've really seen this go from a, as you said, sci-fi story to actual reality. I mean, we're seeing actual Tesla vehicles on road tests where there's nobody touching that steering wheel. Granted, there are still people behind the steering wheel, hopefully, as they should be, but we're actually seeing you know, governments and, and actual lawmakers say, it's okay for you to use these cars autonomously in certain places, which really brings this closer to reality, which begs the question, you know, as someone who is visually impaired, this opens up an entirely new landscape and world with the potential of being able to potentially own a vehicle. Well, that's the theory behind it, right? So the idea is that we could potentially one day own our own car as blind people. And that's the, the dream, I think, for someone like myself who's never driven a car, never owned a car, uh, but I've always wanted to. I've always wanted to be able to do that Sunday drive to the country pub and have a nice meal. You know, those kind of things have been out of my reach. They've not been able to be done without the need for someone else in my life taking me. So whether it's a taxi or whether it's a friend or whether I have to get a bus or a train, I always have to get someone else involved. The spontaneity of life is just not there when you can't drive. And that's not just the case for blind people, it's the case for anybody who, uh, you know, can't drive a car. And there's lots of people out there in that, that position. It can be simply down to cost, right? So it's not just about disability. But with the idea of driverless cars coming along, the idea of ownership of a car, the, the, the whole discussion around ownership of a car is changing. Do we even need to own cars? Could we rent a car, ride share? All these schemes that we've come to get to know through companies like Uber, and Lyft, the idea of, you know, you, you essentially use a car, we would see it as a taxi for many years, now we call it rideshare, uh, where you're essentially using someone's car to get around without having to buy your own. Now, for people living in big cities, this can save them a lot of money, it can save a lot of uh, cost, it can save a lot of tarmac, having to build car parks and space, and of course, it does wonders for the environment if there are less cars on the road. You know, there's an interesting fact on this, about the number of, you know, when you actually think about it, if we all think independently, you think about it as well, Mark, from your point of view, how much time does your car sit on the tarmac doing nothing? And when you think about it, it's probably quite a lot of time it spends doing nothing. 
You know, I remember having a conversation with my Volkswagen dealer, and a friend of mine is the owner of the dealership, and we were talking about the future of vehicles. And I think at that point, the conversation was about uh, electrification. You know, cars becoming less reliant on gas and the impact on the environment of having an electric vehicle. And one of the things that he said really struck a note with me, and it goes back to that you know statement you just made, which is, do we even need to own vehicles in the future? Is it a sustainable business model? Because him, as a dealership, he relies on selling cars. But he looks 10 years ahead and he sees a world where you have all these autonomous vehicles which are as you said just kind of connected to a rideshare app where you can just call upon a vehicle that'll be there in five minutes and take you where you need to be without having to rely on gas without having to rely on someone driving that car it just goes and then it goes on its merry way and does the same thing and when you need a vehicle you just summon it so i don't think you know we even need to own a vehicle anymore so i'm with you on that side of things you know the amount of time that's spending on my driveway, it could be making money out there. And that's why, you know, apps like, you know, the Uber you know, are as popular as they are because people are putting, you know, their cars to use when they're not being in use otherwise. So that's a pretty interesting scenario. And I can definitely see that maybe not 10 years from now. I think we have a lot of regulatory hurdles, a lot of safety issues to really get over because there have been several accidents where people have decided that it would be smart to get into the backseat while their Tesla is driving itself. I mean, obviously not advised by anybody, especially Tesla, let alone the lawmakers. But there, once we get over those hurdles and we have mass acceptance, this is really going to change the landscape, not only in terms of electrification and automation, but just the, the ability to get around when you need it and only pay for what you need. Why should I pay $30,000 for a vehicle that, as you said, is going to sit on the tarmac or sit in my driveway uh, for half the time? I think it's definitely something that we have, you know, it's going to happen in our lifetime. And it's, it's just an extension of everything else we've come to get used to. You know, the idea of going to the store to buy stuff now has changed. We do it through an app. We go to an app. We purchase product. The product comes to us. We've got used to this idea. Service delivery um, in the sense of monthly fees through our television. We are now used to paying for TV shows per month or music subscriptions, essentially buying our music collection every month. We've become used to doing that. And it's the same, that service delivery, that regular service, that subscription-based service is what is going to come to vehicles. And it is going to be so much more convenient. Uh, and of course, it'll have a huge impact on the blind community. Stephen, we're going to keep the conversation going. We're going to take a quick break, but coming up after the break, we have a special guest on deck to talk about his views on how these vehicles will become, you know, begin to present themselves to society and how accessibility can and should be at the heart of everything they do. So stick around. It is Double Tap TV. I am Mark Flalo. He is Stephen Scott. And we get to our special guest after a quick break here on Double Tap TV. Love Double Tap TV? Listen to AMI-audio for Double Tap Canada every Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern for news and reviews on everything tech. This is Double Tap TV. Welcome back to this edition of Double Tap TV, talking all about autonomous vehicles, and maybe in our lifetime we'll see this happen. I am Marco Flalo. Alongside me is Stephen Scott, who is standing by with a very special guest on this week's episode. Yeah, joining me now is Gus Alexiou, a freelance writer who is often found writing for Forbes magazine on a range of topics. Most recently, he's written about the new age of autonomous vehicles and how the disability community will benefit from them. Gus, really great to have you here on Double Tap TV. Now, as I mentioned up top, you are visually impaired yourself. So... I guess the obvious question might be for most people, how does someone with a sight condition get excited about cars? Uh, certainly enough to go and write about them. Well, really, really I suppose it did come, around, uh, come about as a result of, of the vision impairment because my vision impairment caused me to stop driving. And then, you know, I felt that very, very acutely. And, you know, I realised that in the background, there's this, you know, build up of news really over the last 10 years about autonomous vehicles, um, which wasn't something I was... Um, I, I was necessarily specialising in that time, but working as an accessibility journalist, as I have done over the last uh, 10 years, my, 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 my radar even sharpened towards this, and I began to see, you know, the amount of use cases uh, there could be and how useful it could be for people with, 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 with a variety of disabilities, including sight impairment. And yeah, I mean, I just suppose there was a kind of, that, there was that kind of intersection of both uh, personal and professional interest uh, from, from there, because as I say, um, when my vision impairment started, um, 
the loss of driving was one of the first things that really hit home to me. Oh, you know, life has changed and I'm no longer able to do something uh, that, 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 I, that, that I was once able to do. I'm, I'm very into um, kind of technology and, and to work arounds and finding out ways of adapting. And uh, for, for, for me, I realised that there is no technological workaround to not being able to drive due to, due to sight loss. There is no wearable uh, you know, technology that you can use to kind of enable you to see better, um, you know, there, there, there is nothing um, that will get you to an absolute loss. And so I realised that actually the ultimate workaround would be um, not driving at all and having autonomous vehicles. And so this has always been something that's, that's tantalised me somewhat. Now, over the years, I've heard of a number of projects that aim to emulate the driving experience for blind people. So, for example, someone might sit in the driving seat directing, or perhaps it's done remotely. Now, autonomous vehicles take all of that, ex that experience away, right? So I wonder, as someone who used to drive, is the desire for a driverless car for you to emulate the driving experience again, or instead be used as a means of independent travel and that's it? Yeah, there, this is something I've thought of, um, of, of quite a bit. And the, the, the... Yes, there is something to say for the actual experience of being hands on the wheel driving and being the one in control and kind of putting, you know, foot to foot, putting one's foot down and, you know, one always has those cliches of kind of, you know, open top car on a bright sunny day and, you know, and, and, and having that, 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 that kind of good feeling. But the ultimate truth is that what it does boil down to is freedom and flexibility and having the ability to go where you want, when you want in an accessible and cost-effective way. So, so yes, I mean, nothing beats that kind of, you know, that, that kind of, because it also seems a rite of passage, really, isn't it? Passing your driving test, it's, you know, uh, you know it's whatever it might be, 17, 18, 19. And, you know, having that freedom to, to suddenly go out wherever you want and explore new areas and, do, and take on new options. But, um, but I think once one gets past that, um, one realises there is just a kind of the practical options of wanting to be able to visit places and go to places where you want and not having to be reliant on public transport or on taxis or on the kind of grace of others giving you lifts to places. So, so, so yeah, I think, you know, th th there will always be that part of me that, 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 that misses the, uh, the, just the feeling of control you have from, you know, you know, being in a car and doing the steering and the acceleration yourself. But I think you get to, you learn to live with that and you, you go, okay, well, that, that, that's that. So the more important thing does become just having that practicality of, of having access to vehicles. You know, I always think back to watching one of the first videos that Google put out where a blind guy called Steve Mann used a driverless car to get himself to the nearest Taco Bell to get some food. Um, this was obviously done under supervised conditions, I should say. There were people in the car with Steve as he did this. But he sat in the driver's seat and he let the car take control so they could get to the Taco Bell. Then he went off to the laundry uh, to, or to get uh, to the store to get his uh, laundry from the store. A man walks out his front door wearing a brown sweater, khaki pants, a newsboy cap and sunglasses. He heads to a Toyota Prius emblazoned with Google logos, a can shaped sensor spinning on the roof. Passengers wait inside. Good morning, Steve. Hey, Nathaniel, how are you? Doing just great. He takes the driver's seat. Go ahead, Steve. Steve rests his hands at his sides as the car pulls onto the road, the steering wheel turning on its own. Look, Ma, no hands. <laughs> no hands anywhere. No hands, no feet. No hands, no feet, no nothing. I love it. The Prius rolls down a quiet residential street. So we're here at the stop sign. Yep. Car's using radars and laser to, to check and make sure there's nothing coming either way. I find myself looking. <laughs> Old habits die hard, man. They, they, they don't die. Hey, anybody up for a taco? Yeah, yeah. What do you want to do, do today, Steve? I'm, I'm all for taco though myself. All right, well, let's go get a taco at the drive thru Words on the bumper read, self-driving car. The car slows. And we're turning into the parking lot. You know, pounding. There we go. Now we kind of creep along here. Does anybody have any money? I've got money. No, I've got my wallet right here. <laughs> you roll down your window and order a burrito. You know, after watching that video, I was so excited because it really did show the true potential here. And it also showed that big tech was thinking that way too. Um, and I think what many people don't realize, truthfully, Gus, is the anxiety 
and the stress that comes with journeys in, say, a taxi, for example. You know, even just asking the driver to stop for a coffee en route can feel like a huge ask, and it comes often with a, a sigh or a denial of, of even doing it. Um, and this is the reality of, of travel for a lot of people. But with this new type of tech, it, this puts us firmly in full control. Even if initially only 20 or 30% of the population um, or less than that even, are erring towards the autonomous vehicle site. As a, as a disabled person, if you feel, well, I'm doing something that is very common to huge segments of the population, I'm just like everyone else, I'm doing something in exactly the same way, that is a great feeling as opposed to, you know, what we have at the moment where we are siloed off into very expensive private transport or um, inaccessible public transport. And we just feel there's just generally a grating sense of injustice that, that goes with that, which I think autonomous vehicles could alleviate, hopefully. That's fingers crossed on that. Okay, stick around, Gus, because I want to get into the technical side of all of this. Uh, also, how long we're likely to wait until we actually see these vehicles on the roads, and also how they will appear initially. All that to come, Mark, on a very interesting episode of Double Tap TV this week. I think you'll agree. Oh yeah, there's no doubt in my mind, and I think you guys at home will agree as well. So uh, do reach out with your feedback. The email address, again, is feedback at ami.ca. You can reach out on Twitter at Double Tap Canada with the hashtag Ask Double Tap, and of course now on Instagram at DoubleTap.online. We continue with Gus and Stephen after a quick break here on Double Tap TV. For more great Double Tap TV content, visit ami.ca slash Double Tap. This is Double Tap TV. We're back on this episode of Double Tap TV. Thank you guys, as always, for getting involved. I am Mark Aflalo, and Stephen Scott continues his conversation with Gus Alexiou, freelance writer for Forbes magazine. That's right, Mark. I am chatting with Gus this week, uh, as you say, the freelance writer for Forbes magazine and a huge fan of the world of driverless car technology. Now, Gus is himself visually impaired, and prior to losing his sight, he loved driving. Uh, Gus, of course, we're all excited about the potential of driverless cars, but what's the reality here? When are we likely to see these vehicles on the road? Yeah, I think um, like any of this kind of emerging tech, the timescales are, are difficult to predict, but I mean, the feeling I get, and this is something I've written about quite extensively in my work as an accessibility journalist, the feeling I get is that on a technological level, the pieces are in place to allow it to happen. And even within a couple of years, for a blind, per a visually impaired person uh, to be able to do it in terms of, you know, the, the AI of the way the car operates and the actual mechanics of the way the car operates. The bit, the, the piece that's missing is the legislative framework, framework to support to support this. So, you know, it's not just a question of just the cars themselves being able to work, but the areas being mapped, but also what are the rules around standardization of parts and, you know, different sensors that should be in cars, you know, which governments are going to permit what. And I think, one of the even one of the more pertinent points is also is what is what are the relationship with autonomous autonomous vehicles going to be with legacy vehicles on the road um uh you know people drive you know human drivers so i get the impression that actually if we scrap the whole system today and we just started from a point of autonomous vehicles and only autonomous vehicles it would be infinitely doable and we would be able to gear up relatively quickly but it's this interaction of how much do we strip back the old system uh, to insert this new system and can these two systems live together. I think those are the questions over and above, you know, fitting out a car and making it drive autonomously, because there are places in the world um, where this is happening. I mean, um, there's an area in Phoenix, Arizona, where Waymo, which is a spin-off from Google, uh, are running an autonomous vehicle fleet. And it's actually, you know, it's the residents of that place are living in the future and able to use autonomous vehicle. But that, that hasn't been scaled up yet. That is restricted to this one area. You know, we're in a very unusual position here, aren't we? Normally we're fighting to make sure that accessibility is considered from the outset rather than it being added in later, making the technology less uh, you know, useful or even usable to us. But actually, in this case, accessibility is at the very heart of this technology because it levels the playing field between those who can independently move around freely and those who require public services. Yes, definitely. Um, because, you know, that, as you say, that accessibility layer naturally exists uh, for something that's new and novel and everyone can can deal can do with that extra information and the researchers do need to work out kind of how how the vehicle communicates with people um because the you know the well i, I wouldn't say the driver passenger relationship the vehicle passenger relationship is going to be 
a very, very important thing. Because what we also have to remember is that, you know, t taxi drivers, for example, they, they actually do a great deal. They, they, they can provide a great deal of assistance uh, to, 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 to people of all kinds of disabilities in the way they give information, in the granular level of detail they might give about, you know, hey, we've arrived at the destination and it's, you know, it's over there and here's the landmark to, to, to spot it and, you know, it's 30 degrees that way or whatever. So, you know, the way the, 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 the car talks to the passenger, I think, has to be done in a very informed, sorry, in a very informed, very, very deliberate manner. It's, it can't just be like an Alexa style get out of the car now, you've arrived at your destination. But it, it has to be that kind of level of information, not just um, not just throughout the journey, but prior to booking the journey and, you know, disembarking as well. So so, so that opportunity is there. And my, my great hope with this technology, as you say, often we, we, when, when there are exciting novel new technologies around, people rush in and accessibility gets left on the sidelines and it gets retrofitted later on. And we go through, as we're seeing now, still now, unfortunately, with the World Wide Web, 30 years or so on, lawsuits occurring about inaccessible websites and having to kind of fight back to get what should have been baked in at the start. And I just hope with autonomous vehicles that these accessibility considerations are baked in from the start. It's impossible to know when these vehicles can start running about on our streets, I guess. I mean, you mentioned earlier it is literally driven by the lawmakers. But can you speculate on how the vehicles will begin to appear? My initial thought around autonomous vehicles was that, you know, I would own my autonomous vehicle, my neighbour would own their autonomous vehicle, I might have an autonomous uh, Volvo, they might have an autonomous Ford, and we'd all be having our, our, our separate vehicles parked in our separate driveways and just be using them much in the same way as people use cars that they, that, you know, human-driven cars today. Um, I think what's much more likely is that big tech companies and the, the Ubers of this world, the Googles of this world, uh, like to evolve a ride-sharing model where it becomes a kind of mobility as a service model, uh, you book a ride, it, it, come, it turns up to your house or wherever you are um, out and about, and uh, you're, able to, you, you're able to use it much as an Uber, but with, with no driver. But the advantage, I think, that will be in that model will be that the cost will be significantly less. The way it penetrates into society initially is ride sharing. Gus Alexio, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on Double Tap TV with us this week. Thank you so much for coming on to talk with us about autonomous cars. You know, maybe one day we can do this interview in a driverless car speeding down the highway. Mark, that sounds like a great idea. Slow down! <laughs> Thank you, Gus. Uh, thank you, Stephen. As always, guys, you at home, if you want to get involved, the email address, feedback at ami.ca. On Twitter, we are at Double Tap Canada with the hashtag, which is Ask Double Tap, and now on Instagram, at doubletap.online. Hope you learned something special this week, and uh, maybe you're going to head on down the waiting list for that uh, next Tesla with that autonomous driving feature. On behalf of Gus Alexio and uh, Stephen Scott, I am Mark Aflalo. Thank you guys for being here. We'll catch you on our next episode of Double Tap TV. For more great Double Tap TV content, visit ami.ca slash Double Tap. Hosted by Marka Flalo and Stephen Scott. Editing, Jordan Steves. Production assistance, Wendy Kaufman. Content review, Zachary Flalo. Social media, Andy Wynn. Segment producer, Sean Priest. Voiceover, Anna Vicino. Integrated described video specialist, Ron Rickford. Coordinating producer, Jennifer Johnson. Director, production, Karen Nye. Director Programming, Brian Perdue. VP Content Development and Programming, John Melville. President and CEO, David Arrington. Copyright 2021, Accessible Media Inc.